So congratulations. Um, a big win for Endeavor Jordan. And I am impartial, even though I love all of you so much, I'm very impartial. And um, I wanna say also hello to the whole Endeavor Jordan team. Um, you guys were such great hosts when I was in, in uh, Jordan. Um, it was amazing. I had a, a fantastic time. I was um, with, with uh, Hassan Alawi. I went all over the country to um, Karak, to the north. I mean, you name it. I saw the whole country much Zarqa, better. Than Karak, yes, Zarqa and Karak, Erbed, yeah. I think. Yes. Bid in every, all over the place. I ate months off. I did it all. Um, and inshallah, I will come back someday and celebrate again with you. And so anyway, uh, uh, Ramadan Karim to everybody. Okay, now that I've gotten that out of the way, uh, I want to basically tell you what we're gonna talk about today. So I wanna spend about 25 minutes or so, maybe a little longer, talking about the subject of my new book and a little bit about the old book because it's still relevant and I think they're related. Um, so I'll, I'll have a presentation for that, but then I wanna leave time for Q&A because you know, there's nothing worse than listening to your own voice when you're Zooming from your apartment for an hour and nobody wants that. So let's make this interactive. Um, and, uh, and we'll, we'll just get into it. Uh, so as, as, as I mentioned, uh, I've written two books. The first one is this one, um, which features our friend Zaid in it. And the new one is, is Fear of Missing Out, which comes out tomorrow. You can pre-order right now as you're listening to this, if you want on Amazon. Um, and there are also electronic versions of it on Amazon. So uh, certainly um, if you're interested, I would love it if you would pre-order uh, the book. But um, but uh, I'm going to be talking about both of those, and and um, they are very hot topics, and, and especially in this time in which we live, which is such a strange time. So let me put up my presentation. Um, and are we seeing that? I guess I have to share screen, so let me do that. Um, okay, brilliant. Okay. So I have this image up here because I think that image represents kind of where we all ideally want to get to in our lives and our careers. And that's a place where we are focused. We are looking in the right direction. What we look at is, is positive and um, we're choosing that thing and we are not distracted by the outside world. That's where we want to be. Um, that's where ideally we can make the best decisions and, and have the most success in our personal lives and our professional lives. But the reality is most of us, this is our reality. It's that phone screen with so many notifications. And if you look at some of these stats, how many uh, people uh, sleep with their phones within reach? The fact that 80% of smartphone users use, uh, look at their phone right after waking up. The fact that more than half of social media users mention that they feel FOMO when they're away from social networks and they're away from news. We're not there. And in fact, what's happening here is that all of these devices, and in fact, our society these days provokes us to have an anxiety around missing out. This is known as fear of missing out, which many of you have heard of. I, you know, I was, uh, I'm always impressed everywhere I go in the world, basically. I mean, there's been a couple of exceptions. I remember I was in Argentina once. I was in a room of like 50 people and none of them had heard of FOMO, which kind of threw me. But in the Middle East, it's definitely a thing, and especially because in the Middle East, people speak English very well. It's something that is, um, has been picked up by, by the community, right? Um, and that's why I believe that today, we're no longer homo sapiens. Uh, we have evolved into FOMO sapiens. We're doing so many things. We're distracted by our devices, by opportunities, by that bright, shiny object, by the chance to go on this, to this place or to study here or to take this new job or to start this new startup. All of these things that we're dealing with have us completely distracted and unfocused. And it's, it's, it's um, something that I think all of us can relate to. Now, interestingly, uh, FOMO is something that usually is presented in, in the media as something that's funny. Uh, it's a source of many memes, right? Uh, tweets, I mean, that tweet goes back, I think, to 2013. It's a jokey. It's in uh, advertising campaigns for different products. There's a very famous video by Ellen DeGeneres where she explains what it's like to have FOMO in Hollywood. And so, you know, it's kind of like the kind of thing that people love to, to laugh about. And in fact, uh, what's funny is I actually, uh, the reason that I wrote this book, and this has direct effect for everybody here in the room, was that I was um, at the ISP in Beirut, and uh, I was talking to Kevin Ryan, who's like a major entrepreneur in New York City, 
um, founder of Gill Group and other companies, DoubleClick, and he's a you know, big deal. And he was on my panel. He was my co-panelist. And I was talking to him and I was, you know, I was like happy to be talking to him because he's a big deal. And we were interrupted by another panelist who said, you know, can I interrupt? I'm so sorry. And I said, um, sure, assuming he wanted to talk to Kevin. But actually, he wanted to take a selfie with me because his daughter is obsessed with FOMO. And so it was at that moment I thought, wow, FOMO is this thing that people have this very personal relationship with and it's funny. Um, maybe I should write a book about that. So I remember I was at that last night celebration at the beach party. If you were there, you probably saw smoke coming out of my head because I was having a big idea. Um, and it, it's interesting also because it's not just about sort of the internet, but it's, it goes into also sort of our relationships with others. So we, you know, we all know that person with FOMO, but I did a radio show uh, last year where I had a call, call in people sort of talking about FOMO here in New York City. And I had three callers who called in and said that their baby has FOMO, right? And you think about it, try to put a kid to bed. They don't, they don't wanna miss out on anything. I had another caller who said that their dog has FOMO. And in fact, there was a new company called FOMO Bones that basically makes dog bones that have CBD in them so that you can get your dog a little high and they won't wait for you by the door when you leave. So it's, 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 it's amazing to me how, how we have this lighthearted relationship with FOMO, but the reality is that FOMO is not harmless. FOMO actually has real implications for our mental health, for our productivity, and for our finances and investments. And so think about this, you know, as I, as I researched the book, I decided to do a bunch of research. And what I was amazed to see is that over the past 10 years or so, there has been a litany of research in, uh, in clinical psychology and in, in actual journals all about FOMO and its, its sort of its, its implications for our mental health, for our productivity, for the way we view ourselves. Because when we compare ourselves to others, we feel that FOMO, we tend to have lower self-esteem, lower mood. So it actually really is, is, has an effect on the way we view ourselves within the wider context of the world. And this is especially pervasive of young, young people. So even if you say to yourself, yeah, this is really not me, I guarantee you, if you talk to the younger people that you know who are living their lives online, this is something that they really, really live with. It affects them. But also anybody who's been on LinkedIn can relate to that feeling as well. I mean, we're all type A successful people. And yet you look on LinkedIn and you see all of your friends who just got the promotion or the job or all of the accolades, right? And, and it, we can't help but compare ourselves to them. Number two, productivity. FOMO takes us away from the things we truly want to be doing and sucks us into the things that you know, are easy to be sucked into, our phones and how much time we're on screens and the, the, the high degree of connection. And you can actually check this. It's always valuable to do this, and I'm sure many of you do. Looking at, I mean, that's my phone, right? So I, I'll come clean. Two and a half hours on my phone. Uh, and that was a little earlier this year. So, you know, it's fine. But look at how much of that time is spent on social networking, right? Uh, it, it's, it's a pretty high number. Uh, and it takes me away from other things that I could be doing that are, that are far more valuable. And then, of course, there's financing, uh, our, our, our money. And so a third of Americans spend excessively because of FOMO. They're trying to keep up on experiences that other people are having and, and they want to have too. And so they end up spending money on things they don't even really want or need. And that's, a, that's actually a, a study done by Charles Schwab. Um, half of millennials spend money on all kinds of things, including apparently tattoos, which I thought was kind of interesting. Uh, and then it gets into our investments. And so for all of us, you know, in the, in the world of endeavor, of course, we're business people and we think about investments and all of the economic bubbles have an element of FOMO because you have the early investors, the savvy folks that get in and they start making money. And then everybody on the sidelines who doesn't really know what they're doing sees that, oh my goodness, I can make a lot of money. And guess what? Everybody's making money but me. And they start buying into what the stock market or the tech bubble or the, 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 the financial crisis or sort of like the mortgages before the financial crisis or Bitcoin is a great example. Um, Theranos, which is the, uh, of course the case study in the venture capital world where you had a lot of really smart people that were investing based on this idea that they were gonna get really rich even though they didn't understand the technology but they knew that the board of directors of Theranos was a bunch of very high profile people. So they were like, well, if those people are investing in this, why shouldn't I? I mean, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of obvious that I'm going to make money it was FOMO and they lost everything. And so that, uh, that is, that's the nature of how it affects us. And there's a particular uh, sort of effect right now in the age of, of COVID, right? So 
Listen, as the guy who invented FOMO, I've been thinking, I've had plenty of time in my apartment to think about what FOMO looks like in the age of COVID-19. And in the beginning, uh, it was about the panic buying. I mean, go try to buy toilet paper or hand sanitizer, not easy. And then of course, as we went into lockdown, there was that group of people who wanted to have that one last party. And so they all flew to Florida in the United States and partied on the beaches. And then when they went home, gave everybody around them Corona. Uh, there's the news addiction. And I, I, I personally have had to break that addiction because if I watch the news, I feel unwell. It's so stressful. But in the beginning, all I did was watch the news for days on end, right? Um, and then also, uh, it sort of affected our culture because after we all locked ourselves inside, and I know, Jordan, it's amazing. we were just talking about this in the green room, how effective your government response has been. So congratulations. It sounds like things are going quite well. Um, obviously, <laughs> you know who our president is. So it's been a whole different situation. We've had a lot more um, um, cases here. And um, it's been um, a lot of uh, sort of disagreement. And we'll talk about the implications later, but about what's going on. And so Anyway, we locked ourselves in our homes and um, for the first couple of weeks, it was kind of like a little honeymoon. And maybe you felt this too. It's sort of like, oh, guess what? Um, I have nothing to miss out on. I have no meetings. I have no work. I, I work from remotely. I've got no parties. I've got no movies to go to. You know, I'm just stuck at home. Why don't I read the book I wanted to read? Why don't I learn how to cook? Why don't I, you know, I wanted to hang the picture on the wall for the last three years. Why don't I do that? And so the, actually the whole digital conversation around FOMO was around um, sort of, wow, FOMO is dead. And I thought that was really interesting. And I also was like, well, that's good for the world. But as a guy who just wrote a book about FOMO, that is not good. Um, now the New York Times, gotta love the New York Times, my hometown newspaper, has a split decision on this because in the beginning, they're saying, ah, oh, FOMO is dead. But now it's FOMO has sur survived the coronavirus. And in fact, I believe that that is true. And I'll tell you why. Number one is because once we got over uh, sort of that couple of weeks of honeymoon period where it was kind of fun to be stuck at home, it gets very old. And in fact, um, I feel like the FOMO is much more profound. It's like fear of missing out on the life that I would have led, fear of missing out on family experiences, on seeing people that I love, on just going on the subway or going to a restaurant, all these sorts of things. I mean, they're deep, deep, deep. And at the same time, um, I also think that, um, that uh, there's been this interesting thing around like getting things done. So in the beginning of coronavirus and quarantine, I remember seeing this tweet that my mom sent it to me and she said like, oh, Patrick, this is a chance you can write your next book. And I said, mom, like, let me get the, this one out before we even talk about another book. But the idea was we we're going to do a lot of things and we all had these lists of things to do. Well, let's look back at how we've been spending our, our COVID time. I'll give myself an example, right? So I showed you my stats, okay? Now I'm going to come clean. This is, this is my reality. Okay, doubled my mobile usage and look at total screen time. 12 hours a day on the screen. A lot of that, I couldn't even tell you what. I seriously have no idea. I was watching YouTube videos, probably. And so I think a lot of us have realized that the FOMO, you know, we remove the external events and sort of like outside of our homes, but now we have digital lives that are really, really busy. I mean, the amount of Zoom events and talks, I mean, you guys are here right now. I'm sure you could be doing something else. I'm glad you're here with me, but how much, I mean, I, I once had a night, I had five Zoom events. So we are moving FOMO into a new stage, an online stage. And so it remains a problem. And that is why, number one, facepalm. Number two, we still need to learn how to keep calm and say no to FOMO. And so um, that's what I want to talk about uh, today. And, but before we get into that, I do want to give a bit of a history of FOMO because I think it's important to understand the context before we deal with sort of how we manage it in our lives. So everybody knows about the first Homo sapiens, East Africa, two million years ago, early man roaming around, probably made its his, his or her way to Jordan at some point or another, much earlier than other places. Um, but have you heard about the first FOMO sapien? There it is, young Patrick. Uh, and so I want to tell you the history, uh, but I also want to tell you that if, if you don't believe any of this, and I hope you do believe me, but if you doubt me, you can just Google it because it's on the internet. So it's true. Um, history of FOMO. So I come from a small town in the state of Maine. 
Maine is famous for lobsters. It's also famous for really being quite rural. There's not a lot to do. And so I grew up in a town where there wasn't a lot going on and there wasn't a lot of FOMO. Really, the only thing to do that was particularly exciting was to go to Dairy Queen once a week. That was kind of like the highlight of my week. And so as a kid, I didn't have a lot of FOMO. And then something happened. I went to Harvard Business School and I arrived actually pre, uh, pre uh, social media. So there was no Facebook. In fact, Mark Zuckerberg was across the river at Harvard Yard developing the first version of Facebook. But it didn't matter because student life at HBS, like any MBA program that anybody's been to who's on the call, is kind of like a combination of all these social networks without actually having to be on them. You're living in proximity with a bunch of sort of very ambitious people who are uh, sharing all the wonderful things they're doing and you feel a lot of feelings and you want to be part of everything. And as, as the Endeavor Network knows, I mean, this is a, it's a very much that kind of group. If you get a bunch of Endeavor folks in a room, it's gonna be very similar. Now, um, I had just come from New York City and I had lived through 9-11. And 9-11, as you can imagine, and we all lived it together, but obviously being in New York City, right there, a mile away, it was so shocking and I thought to myself, the world will never be the same. And so as a result, my, my sort of natural tendency was to want to do everything all the time because I never knew if the world would go back to normal. And so I wanted to live life to the fullest. And so I did. I was everywhere all the time when I got to business school. I did every event. I interviewed for a million jo jobs I had no interest in. I remember going to jobs. And I was thinking like, why am I here? but I just felt like I should take advantage of the opportunity. I went on all the trips, I did it all. And so as a result, I realized I was feeling not just a desire to take advantage of things, but I felt anxiety that I had to do everything. And I started calling that fear of missing out. I shortened it to FOMO and I wrote an article about it in the school newspaper called Social Theory at HBS, the Guinness's Two Foes. Talking about the fact that FOMO was a pervasive uh, sort of culture at business school and in fact, uh, it was in the humor section. So it was kind of jokey, but it, it got very popular on campus. And so I graduated in 2004 and I thought that was kind of the end of FOMO, but 15 years later, there were a, a bunch of things that I don't want to spend time on today, but i um, happy to talk about in the Q&A. It made its way into the dictionary, including the most important dictionary, the urban dictionary. And then it spread all across the world. And I need an Arabic one. So if anybody can help me out, send it my way because we wanna make sure we're representing the Arab speaking world in this presentation, we're inclusive. But, um, but there you go, that's the story of FOMO. And so um, it's been talked about, it's even in the dictionary, but the reality is that as much research as I've done on the topic of FOMO, I realized that there was never a good definition put together. And so I decided to do this as I wrote this book. And so here's what FOMO is, it's two things. Number one, it's an aspirational anxiety. So it's this feeling that there's something better out there that's happening that we're, than what we're doing right now. And it's based on perception that there's something better out there. So perception is the critical word here, because if we had perfect information, like say I see a picture of a beautiful lake and somebody's snapped their photo in front of it on Instagram, and I had been to that lake 60 times, I can say, well, you know, that lake is very nice or that lake is not that nice. This person used 17 filters or they use the right angle. But you know, if I had perfect information, I would know. But if I don't have perfect information, I am then dealing with an information asymmetry and I am filling the gap between reality and fiction with my own sort of projection. And so that's what's happening. We see something, but perception can be deception. In fact, the lake you see right there and that image to the left is actually a toxic lake. And if you went into it, you'd have to go to the hospital. So that is the reality of this aspiration. It may not be true at all. The second thing is about the herd. So if you think back to the earliest humans, they were keenly aware of what they had and didn't have, but needed in order to survive in the, in the, the race for survival, the survival of the fittest, right? So you had um, the reality that if you were excluded from the group, let's say, you wouldn't know where you could get the best food or the best shelter and you would perish. And so that it carries on today, but it manifests its, itself in things like wanting to get the new Apple product. And I'll tell you something, I am that guy. I am the guy who, even though I could have ordered it online, some, for some reason, I wanted to wait in that line. I'd get up at six in the morning every day 
and I would wait in that line. And it, I, I don't know why, but it was that driving me. It was the FOMO. So, so that is, is a big part of, of what you're feeling when you're feeling FOMO. It's that group dynamic. Now, as a result of this, if you look at these two together, what is FOMO in its essence? It's really about following the herd. And this is where I have, I, have a, a, I had an experience uh, many years ago of visiting um, the Serengeti and watching the migration of the wildebeest. And it's a beautiful thing. And they stick together because when they're together, nobody can pick off uh, more than one at a time, right? This swarm protects the group. The reality, we are not wildebeest. If we don't go to our friend's birthday party or we don't watch Tiger King, which I imagine is popular in Jordan as well. And by the way, don't waste your time with it. But if we don't watch that, we're not going to die. And so we as, as, as people, um, as business people, as citizens, as family members, um, we don't want to be followers. It's something that's just not attractive. Um, and in fact, that is, 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 is something that I, I always like to bring up to people so that they understand that uh, in its essence, it's about taking direction from somebody else and not from you. That said, okay, so that's FOMO. Uh, as you, if you were paying close attention, you may have noticed that the article I wrote back in business school was called Social Theory at HBS, McGinnis's Two Foes. So there was another foe that never got famous. It's just kind of like uh, if you, you know, Alanis Morissette, the singer, has a twin brother who is a yoga instructor, apparently not famous outside of his yoga studio. But still, you know, he lives on. And so FOBO <laughs> never got famous. I'm here to make it famous today because it's a much more uh, difficult problem. It's much more pervasive than FOMO, and especially in, in, among the types of people that are in, on this call right now. And um, I think it has much more damaging attributes in the long run. So let's talk about FOBO. What is FOBO? FOBO is the classic desire to maximize. It is the anxiety that there is something better out there based on our perception, again, this information asymmetry. Um, and so as a result, we don't want to decide. And we actually view option value as a good in and of itself. So when we're facing a decision, um, and this happens all the time for entrepreneurs, as we know, I mean, this is what is an entrepreneur, if you think about it, it's just somebody who makes more decisions than everybody else, probably. And so, uh, we, we don't have perfect information. We can't know, but there is a temptation to wait, hoping that something better comes along, hoping that, you know, we have an easier decision and that it's clearer for us. And there's this feeling as well that like, oh, I'm just going to keep my options open and have maximum flexibility because that will allow me to make a better decision in the long run. So that's what FOBO is. And um, it's, it's really at the end of the day, what that drives is paralysis, right? Uh, we don't want to make decisions at all. And that, that's the problem. And so I want to give a great example um, that I put in the book that I think illustrates this really well. And it's uh, the, the story of Audi. So Audi, uh, their, uh, their, their motto, Vorsprung durch Technik, I hope I said that correctly, um, means advancement through technology. And the company has $5 billion a year to put into R&D. So it's real money, right? Now, they decided they wanted to be early in the race for an electric car. And in 2009, they announced plans for the first electric car. Unfortunately, they kept on changing their mind. They had FOBO, they wouldn't commit. They kept on waiting for more data, another uh, test, another model. And as a result, a couple of years into it, actually, the a journalist here from, um, um, from Wired Magazine called them out and said, listen, you have analysis paralysis, you have FOBO. It's like, just stop issuing studies, make a product, bring it to market already. Well, of course, as I told you, started 29, 2010, 2011. So by 2012, they get into the point where they've got a new vision for the car. Then it continues, 2015, finally 2018, 2018, that's nine years later, they get their first model. Unfortunately for them, they had to recall it. Now compare that with Tesla. Elon Musk launches it around 2010. Within three years, he's in the market. And because of that, 10 years on, his company, which sells less units, is actually worth three times what Audi is worth in the stock market. And so you can see, I mean, we all know this is the game, of course, of entrepreneurs. Let's take advantage of the fact that the incumbents 
have FOBO. They can't decide. They're waiting around for the perfect outcome. We're waiting for the people in accounting or marketing to, 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 to give us an, another viewpoint and more data. We're waiting for um, the board of directors to hear about it at the next meeting. And they never move forward with the velocity they should given their resources and the, the startups come in and eat their lunch. And of course, we all know how this plays out with venture capitalists. I mean, for those venture capitalists on the line, um, it's, it's very tempting to say, oh, your company looks great. Come back to me in a month with, you know, I just want to see more traction, a little more traction, right? That happens all the time. And so venture capital, I call it a game of foes because entrepreneurs want to create FOMO and um, venture capitalists are classic FOBO thinkers, right? They want to have as much data as they can before making a decision. And oftentimes the only one way to get them to move is to just give them so much FOMO that they can't resist because you get that investor to come in and say, we're closing the round in a week. Are you coming in or aren't you, right? So that is a fascinating dynamic that you see in the world of VC. Uh, it's also important to note that FOBO um, imperils your ability to lead. And so you can't be an Elon Musk when you're mired in indecision. Now, I, I want to talk a little bit about, um, and we, we can get into in the Q&A some, some of the strategies that um, you can use to, to, to tackle FOMO and FOBO. I, I just want to be sensitive on time today because I'd rather do more Q&A than less. Um, but is FOMO always a bad thing? That's a question that uh, I think it's important to think about because in fact, FOMO can be a good thing. Let's think about FOMO versus FOBO in this context. So FOMO, I think a little bit like, and forgive the, the um, this is Ramadan. I should you know, not a good Ramadan example, but um, drinking wine. So maybe you can say drinking coffee. <laughs> um, you get more pepped up. You, uh, maybe you get a little more energy. You want to try something new, right? With drinking wine, you maybe loosen up. You get on the dance floor at the wedding, ask the girl out, you know, something like that that maybe you wouldn't have done. But if you have too much, um, not a good thing, bad for your health, bad for your state of mind, bad for your behavior. FOBO is like smoking cigarettes. It's bad for you. Maybe it feels good, but it's bad for you. And it has secondary effects. It's bad for all the people around you. So while FOMO can have positive side benefits, FOBO is always bad. Now let's talk about why FOMO can be good for you. Well, it goes back to the 10% entrepreneur. And for those of you who are familiar with this, um, great. For those of you who aren't, I'll just give you a, a, quick, a quick take on it. And it's kind of expanded it here, actually, in the new book. I have a chapter called Going All In Some of the Time. And so the idea here is that when you have FOMO, you have a desire to do something. Say you want to start a business or say um, one great example is you want to uh, start a social enterprise. You want to help people. You want to start a charity. And so one thing you could do is give into that information asymmetry and say, you know what? I just really want to help people. I'm going to basically quit my job and start this nonprofit and just try to help everybody. Well, that could be a path for you, but the reality is you have no idea if you even like doing that work. You have no idea if you want to start a company. You have no idea if you want to move to a new city, right? And so making rash decisions based on FOMO and information asymmetry is not a good thing to do. Going all in some of the time, which is to say, give yourself an authentic experience that allows, that allows you to judge whether you like that thing and whether you want to spend more time on it is a great way to address your FOMO, but in a risk mitigated fashion. So don't move to, you know, Dubai, go spend a month there and see if you even like it. And of course, when you get there, you'll realize that of course, Jordan's way better and you'll move home. Uh, don't just quit your job and start the, the social enterprise, launch it part time. Don't start the entrepreneurial venture. Try it part-time. That's the, the concept here. And then as you learn and uncover the information asymmetry and gather more facts, you'll be more effective and your risk of failure will be lower. Now, the great example of this is entrepreneurship. And, and as, uh, as I say, listen, I'm not telling you not to be an entrepreneur full-time. Believe me. For me, entrepreneurs who do it full-time are like superheroes. They, they're amazing. Um, I'm just not that strong. So I don't have the, uh, I guess, or, or I'm learning, but I, I've certainly been afraid of it in the past. And so I felt all this FOMO around entrepreneurship and I felt guilty that I was too afraid to do it. And then I decided to come up with the reasons why it's okay to not be an entrepreneur, just to give myself permission not to do it. And I came up with five reasons. Number one is the lifestyle, the pay. Um, all of you know, they're tough um, until you make it, right? Number two is it can hit your finances. So the typical startup takes years 
to generate an exit. I mean, not everybody's Kareem, right? So it's, it can be very hard. We have to wait a long time. Number three, you're abandoning status and affirmation. So, you know, you go from working at McKinsey to working at the company where you, you printed the business card at home and like bad paper and all your friends are like, wow, what is wrong with you? And then your grandmother, you go to her house and she's like, I don't understand you, like grandson, you know, we were living, you know, in like a small apartment. You're, we worked so hard so that we could put you through school and now you want to have a startup? What's wrong with you, right? And I, I get it. I mean, there's a lot of pressure in the family. Um, you may not have the right idea yet. So Inc. Magazine found of its Inc. 500 companies, 80% roughly found the idea while working in a previous job. I mean, you think about POS Rocket and Zaid, that's like, like that classic story right there. And then failure sucks. I mean, that's doesn't need a lot of explanation. And so that's why I recommend people to be a 10% entrepreneur. Start with 10%, see if you like it, 10% of time, money, energy, and then from there, um, increase until maybe you become a full-time entrepreneur. Or maybe you start investing in other people's companies and build up a portfolio. There's all kinds of ways to engage with that and happy to talk about that in the Q&A, but it is an important part of of what I talk about, and I'll tell you why. Because when I first wrote um, that book, um, it came out in 2016. And the reason that I wrote this book, and the reason I did this in my own life, I've done 25 10% is that I was working at AIG in 2008, and the company blew up, and my stock that I had fell 97%, and my job basically was terrible, and our company was bankrupt, and it was very depressing and awful, and I was miserable because I wasn't diversified. And now, um, uh, I remember when the book came out in 2016, you know, I had done this as a result of that. And my friend said, you know, you're very fixated on, on 2008. You really need to move on because this won't happen again. This is a once in a lifetime thing. Yeah. And I wish it were true, but I mean, here we are living in a time which is arguably much worse and diversification and entrepreneurship and creativity are going to get us out of this mess. And so all of us need to find ways to engage with these opportunities, yeah? Um, and with that, um, I just wanted to leave you with this information. So listen, I have this podcast called FOMO Sapiens. It's distributed by Harvard Business Review. I've had tons of entrepreneurs on and experts in productivity and all kinds of other uh, sort of um, great uh, topics. And I've been uh, amazed that the show has really taken off during the pandemic. So it just hit the top 20 podcast in business in the U S and so, um, and I, I noticed it did very well on Spotify and Jordan. Thank you. Aya. um, you, your listening is driving my ranking up, but, uh, that's the new book. It's available now on Amazon. It's an ebook or you can get physical. And then of course I'm on all the social networks and I love hearing from people. And, um, you know, I'm so honored that to, you have me here and I know it's very late for you, but if you're up late, uh, tomorrow night at six o'clock New York time, having a virtual book party with Nir Eyal, who is a, wrote a book called Indistractable, a book called Hooked. Uh, it's at virtualfearofmissingout.splashdat.com is where you can register. And then uh, I don't think this works for Jordan, but you can text FOMO to 66866 and um, you can reach me. So um, so with that, I'm going to open up, I guess, and pass the, the baton back to Aya and um, I will put it back on camera so we can have a proper conversation. Thank you, Patrick. Very, very interesting talk, as always. You never fail to make me listen fully whenever you're talking. So we have a question from uh, one of my colleagues, Nadine, and she's asking, for someone who has severe FOMO, how would you suggest they manage that? First of all, hello, Nadine. Um, okay, so there, there's two aspects. So we talked about it before there are two aspects to FOMO. There is the aspiration and there's the herd, okay? So I wanna start with the big things in life, what I call high stakes decisions. And then we'll move on to no stakes and low stakes decisions, okay? So for high stakes decisions, you do really need to spend the time thinking about them. This isn't, you know, this is something where you wanna have a process. And so what I've developed is a process to, to overcome your FOMO. and. Um, High stakes decisions consists of, uh, uh, you know, let's say where to move, where, who to marry, where to go to college. It's those things that will impact your life in the medium to long term. And they have sort of major personal and economic implications, okay? Now, 
as I, as I mentioned, it's about perception and it's about the herd. So what you want to do is you want to address each of those in your decision-making process. So number one, you want to think about the perception. This, this, is this thing as great as it looks, right? And so there you want to do your due diligence and say, okay, for example, I want to move to another city. Well, okay, why do, sort of, what, 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 is it even possible for me to move there? Can I afford to do this? Um, have I, do I even like that place? Have I spent time there? Could I get a job there? Like thinking about the practicalities and trying to remove that information asymmetry so that you are filling up the emotion and the fear of missing out with facts so that you can now allow uh, your intuition to do the work it, it's meant to do, which is to help you make a decision. And so you'll actually do a process of due diligence to understand exactly what the opportunity is and you will write it down. You will write a memo to yourself, like an investment memo, because decisions are like investments. Um, we are betting something and we're hoping for a return. So it's really thinking like a venture capitalist. And then um, you'll, you'll, you won't simply just spend time on Google. You'll really do a, sort of a deep dive and talk to people. And once you've gathered information and you feel like you're able to sort of make a decision, if you feel at that point, let's say that you have uh, realized that it is not for you, then your problem is solved. If you feel at that point you still want to do it, then you go to people around you and you share what you've learned with them and get their feedback. Get them to disagree with you. Make sure that your rationale is sound. And finally, if you still want to do it, then you do it because there is no riskless decision in life. Every decision involves some risk, but you have done the work. And so you're no longer basing your decision on fear or FOMO. You're basing it on facts and the work that you have done. So that's the big things. The small things, okay, this is where, this is like where I'm gonna save you guys. Everybody's gonna save like five hours a week right now, so get ready. Um, okay, FOMO, I have 15 Zoom cocktail parties tonight and I can't decide. Um, FOMO, I wanna watch 19, tele you know, all these sorts of things that we, we these, these silly things, what I call no stakes decisions. These are things that don't matter, but you can spend a lot of time actually thinking about them. And so what the idea here is, and it's, it's really powerful, is to just take them off your plate. I call it asking the watch. So for example, if it's like, oh, you know, I have three uh, Zoom parties, I can only go to two of them. I've got to pick between one and the other. Basically what I do is I say, okay, fine. The first Zoom party is an even Zoom party. The second Zoom party is an odd Zoom party. I look at my phone. Oh, it's an even time. I go to the, that one. So I basically outsource it to an inanimate object. Now, why do I do that? Because the reality is they're fine. They're both great. I am injecting the drama into the decision and therefore I must take myself out of it and put it in a third party. So you can either ask a friend to do it, you can ask an inanimate object, but basically the idea is to take yourself out of the decision-making because no matter what you decide, it's perfectly acceptable. Thank you. And we have a very interesting question from Jumana that says, I was once approached by an entrepreneur who was asking for funding for a startup which he wanted to launch while still remaining in his full-time job. As an investor, I was hesitant to invest with him as it seemed to be like a lack of commitment or belief from the entrepreneur's side. I might have been wrong. What, what would you, uh, sorry, would you invest with an entrepreneur who is still in a full-time job? Uh, okay, here's how I think about this. This is a great, you know what? Nobody asked this question. It's such a good one. So thank you for it. Um, okay. If somebody is raising money, it is my view that unless it's friend and family and it's like everybody's kind of understanding, but if they're raising money on commercial terms from a professional investor, they should raise sufficient money for somebody on the team to be able to go full-time, if not everybody. And if they can't do that, then they should continue developing it part-time until they get to that point. And I think, as I recall, correct, if, if I'm correct, and I think I am, um, I remember what Zaid did, which I thought was really smart, when they started their company, um, is like one of the partners continued working, one of the partners went full-time, and the one who was working helped the other one subsidize his living expenses. And so there are a lot of different ways to do this. But I think asking professional investors to give you their money while you are still working and you sort of mitigated your risk is difficult to sell. And so I personally, unless it was somebody I knew really well and I was comfortable um, with that decision and I really understood the particularities of their situation, I think it's, it's a hard sell and you very rarely see it. Okay. Um, and we also have a question from Rena 
who is asking if you're aware of the term JOMO. Uh, she just heard about it recently, the joy of missing out. Yes. Okay. I love that question. Um, yes, JOMO. So I have a lot of feelings about JOMO. And um, I actually heard about it because when you invented FOMO, whenever a new OMO word is, is invented by somebody, your inbox blows up. So I, last year, um, I got a million people sending me an Instagram post by a guy called Will Cole, whose post was retweeted by Brene Brown and went viral. And so I called Will up. He's a great guy. And I said, Will, um, come on my podcast and let's talk about Jomo, right? And in fact, it was invented by another New Yorker, a guy named Anil Dash. And um, the idea is joy of missing out that, you know, I am home, I am in my pajamas while you are running around and I'm happy with that. So here's kind of my view on Jomo. Number one is I like it. I, I mean, who couldn't like that, right? It's great. It's kind of like ice cream, you know, who doesn't like, I mean, maybe somebody doesn't like ice cream, but you know, um, <laughs> Disneyland. The reality is though, like Disneyland is a destination. Jomo is a destination. You still need to get in your car and drive there or you need to fly there. And so it's very easy to say you have Jomo, but uh, it's much harder to get to the place of Jomo. Number two, um, I think Jomo, if you really feel Jomo, why are you posting about it on social media, right? Like it should be, it's kind of a little bit too like um, self-conscious. Um, number three, I think it works really well for small things, but you would never have like, oh, I have Jomo about, you know, never being able to leave my house again or whatever, you know, like not finding true love or stuff like that. So it's a, it doesn't really work there. And also I would say um, right now, people are throwing the word Jomo around a lot. And I'm like, okay, we're all in our houses and we're, we're making the best of it. But like, are you f really feeling joy? Are you joyful that you can't leave your house? And that's why you have to watch four episodes of, you know, like 24 tonight? Of course not. So I, 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 I think it's a useful concept in terms of giving us a place to go, but I think it's limited in its, in its use. Very insightful. And, um, Zara Najjar has a question. She says, hi, P. So glad to have you back. You mentioned FOBO was always bad. Forgive my glass half full nature, but wouldn't a positive effect of FOBO be keeping people innovative and on their toes? Oh, man. Okay, Zara, of course. Now I have to rewrite the book. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, okay, so absolutely. I think in terms of what the way you're positioning it, that is a that's a that's a good point. When I when I mention it in terms of its its negativities for the person who's suffering it, who cannot move, it's very bad. And for the people around them that are waiting for their to, for them to do something before they can actually act, like you know how it is. We all have that friend who never commits to plans on Friday night, and so it drives us all crazy and it damages our relationships. Now somebody may benefit from that, right? Our other friends who we say, you know what, I'm not going to hang out with you. I'm going to hang out with you instead. They may benefit from it, but I don't think that necessarily means that FOMO has a good side. It means that it simply shifts value from one person to another. What do you think of that? <laughs> <laughs> um, we also have a question from Iyad who asks, do you believe everyone has FOMO in some way or another relevant to a thing in life? And then I'll combine it with another question by Sara who's asking, how does FOMO lead to FOBO? Yeah. Okay. That's a great question. Let me show you something. I should like print this out or something. It's, this is kind of interesting and I hope you can see it well, but I mapped out FOMO over the course of a lifetime. And so you could see when you're young, the baby doesn't want to go to bed. It starts going up. And then as you, um, as you get older, you have more and more FOMO because you see the world around you. But when you're a child, you don't have any agency. You can't actually make decisions for yourself. And so therefore, you know, your parents, you may have a little FOMO. Your parents are like, you're not having ice cream for dinner, right? Sorry. When you get to adolescence and then in college and then into the working world, more opportunities, you live in a choice-rich environment, right? A choice-rich environment is what provokes FOMO and the comparisons that that creates. So that's when it goes haywire. Then as you get a little older, you have more information. That information asymmetry I talked about decreases and therefore it goes down and you're also just busy, right? You got like work and family commitments and so you don't have the time to feel the FOMO. Then as you get older, 
um, you have more time, you may retire. And also you start to realize, you know, I'm not going to be alive forever. I want to do things. I've got to do them now. And the FOMO just goes through the roof. And so that's why grandparents are always calling their grandkids all the time and their kids are like, can I come over? Should we go on a holiday together? And so it evolves over our lives. Now, in terms of the relationship between FOMO and FOBO, so um, the things that provoke them are similar. So while they are different, FOMO is about trying to do it all. FOBO is about be being unwilling to commit. Um, they are created by choice-rich environments that have information asymmetry um, in them. And so when you think you have so many choices um, and you don't really know what's out there, um, then that you are susceptible to both of them. Now, there's an interesting thing that, that, that I noticed as well. And this is something that I'm sure you, you get. I mean, you, this, I'm talking about your, your region. When I went to the ISP in Beirut, I spent a day um, in Eastern Lebanon and I visited a Syrian refugee camp. And as we know, it's a very difficult environment. And what I really thought about that is, okay, it was fascinating um, and really sad. Everybody in the refugee camp has a phone and many people have televisions. So they can feel FOMO because they see the world beyond. They see how people are living while they're stuck in this place. Um, so there's a perception out there. Um, even if it's not particularly a choice-rich environment, there's still the ability to engage. But I didn't see a lot of FOBO because people know that they don't have options right now. And so that's an also an interesting thing to keep in mind is that the reason why you feel FOBO is because it's affliction of abundance. And so even though it's terrible, we should actually be grateful to be in a position where we can even have those feelings. Okay. Um, and we have another question by Tamir. Um, he's the managing director of Beyond Capital. Um, and he's asking, how can entrepreneurs balance executing with speed uh, refer referring to your example of Elon Musk and the 10% focus, don't you worry? Sorry, another question pop up, popped up. Don't you worry that a full time entrepreneur would learn faster and eventually execute better? I actually had that question too. <laughs> Good. Okay, absolutely. I will not disagree with you that a full time entrepreneur will move faster, probably also fail faster, which arguably could be good. Um, but what I would say is for the person, so I would never say don't be a full-time entrepreneur if you want to do it, right? If you have the ability to do it, the resources, go do it. There's nothing, and I, I, and I get it, especially as an investor, um, you know, I, and I, I know you guys and, and familiar with the work you've done, of course, uh, but where I am offering this as a solution is to the rest of us, to the people who are, number one, afraid, number two, uh, a lot of entrepreneurs come from wealthy families, or have worked for a long time and have savings. But for that young person who says, listen, I'm not wealthy. I can't afford to quit full time. My idea isn't ready to raise capital. It's for those people um, that, that I offer this idea. And also, of course, folks like Steve Jobs, he started Apple while he was working um, at Hewlett Packard. And so it can be a great way to de-risk the initial stages of a venture, but without a doubt, there reaches a stage where you must either raise capital, go full time in order to scale. And you, it's very difficult to maintain a side hustle forever. People do it. And, and those are more like hobby businesses and there's nothing wrong with that. But yeah, I, I mean, look at Jack Dorsey where he's CEO of two companies at once. Like how sustainable is that? Even just from a health perspective, it's, it's a bad idea. So I, I, I think, you know, we, I agree with you, but I think the both kind of live together. Okay. And we have a question from, um, Anurag, apologies if I pronounced that wrong. Uh, they're asking, is there ever a time when you should have FOMO and it's time to act on something? How do you realize if it's FOMO or it's time to grab the opportunity? Yes, so absolutely. Uh, as, um, as I mentioned, we, we all feel FOMO in different ways. And for me, I mean, this is so fundamental to why I wrote the book, The 10% Entrepreneur. So there's a friend of mine who, um, was investing in a bunch of startups. And I remember, and I'm not a jealous person. That's not my, that's not, I mean, I have plenty of flaws. Jealousy is not one of them. Um, but I remember feeling kind of jealous and thinking like, what, well, you know, why does he do that? And, I, you know, I was kind of annoyed every time he'd talk about his things he was investing in. And one day I realized I was talking to another friend and I realized that the reason why I felt annoyed was because I wished I was doing that too. 
And so rather than just sit there feeling annoyed with him, I decided to say, okay, great. Why don't I try to figure out if I even want to do this? And I did my first 10% and then another and another, and here we are today. And so what I would say is it's very valuable to learn how to listen to these things. If you see your friend run the marathon and you're like, ugh, annoyed, but it may be because you really want to do it too. Um, if you see a friend who travels for a country, so it's okay um, to feel FOMO, especially when you use it as a conduit to learn about what you truly want and then to act upon it. But all I'm saying is don't go crazy. Take an incremental approach. That way you make sure that what looks great on the outside isn't just uh, something you've invented in your head or that you're doing it because you're following the crowd. Um, and we have another question that's anonymous. Can you share some advice on how to overcome FOBO when making a first small investment? Yes. Great question. So I would call that, we'll call it a high stakes decision because, to, because number one, there's money on the line. Number two, it's stressful to you, right? So for like, for somebody who's done a bunch of investments, that would be maybe a low stakes investment, but, but um, for you, it's a high stakes investment. And so here's, again, there are really two elements to FOBO. Number one is that it's that um, desire to maximize, right? I want to get the high, I want to, I've got a limited amount of money and I want to put it in the best company I can. And I would be very upset if I invested in, you know, this one over here, but this one over here did better. Um, you know, there's nothing wrong with maximization. Actually, the research shows. In fact, there are great examples of people who wanted to be the best, but were still decisive. So the problem when you have FOBO isn't necessarily the maximization bit. It's the process you're using to make decisions because when you have FOBO, you want to have all your options open for as long as possible. And the problem with that is if you wait too long, some of your options may disappear, right? And so therefore you still need to be decisive. And so when you have FOBO, um, what you need to do is recognize that you, by keeping your options open, you're never doing anything. And when you choose one thing, of course you must let go of the rest of the things. And that's the part that's so hard. We want it all. We don't want to give up the things that we can't have. And so you have to move away from that. And so the process, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna recommend that you watch my TED video. It's called How to Make Faster Decisions because it lays it out way better than, than it's a very well done video. But basically it's a process whereby you get comfortable with and then let go of the things you cannot have in order to select just one thing. And it's very powerful. I use it all the time and it's, um, it's backed by science and clinical psychology. Okay, and uh, I think we'll take two more questions. Um, an anonymous question saying, a lot of startups are pivoting to capture opportunities COVID-19 has presented. It feels like entrepreneurs will miss out if we don't pivot. But what about over-investing in something which might be short-term? What are your views on that market shift? Yes, I mean, if you think about it, it's so... It's a really good question because um, there's a lot of FOMO in entrepreneurship. There is, I mean, there was, and by the way, you may disagree with what I call FOMO in terms of if you're like a true believer in the blockchain and you may think every blockchain thing is great, but we all know that there's a lot of bogus companies in blockchain. There's some great ones too, but um, if you Google Bitcoin and FOMO, you get over 900,000 hits. So that's just- wow. Yeah, I know, right? The numbers don't lie. So mm -hmm. cannabis, right? I mean, the amount of people in the cannabis space and by the FOMO bones, some people will make fortunes, but like there's a lot of just ridiculous stuff. Um, PPE right now, I mean, that is the new cannabis. It's, it's just, there are waves and there always have been since the tulips in the 1600s. So that's a fundamental reality. Now, in that context though, you ask a really provocative and important question, which is like, how do we pivot to reflect the new reality? And I think that those are not, um, you can do one without doing the other. And so I would say every entrepreneur, and by the way, um, I would recommend, I talk about this. I did an episode of FOMO Sapiens, um, I think three weeks ago called Venture Capital during a pandemic with Beth Ferreira of Firstmark who uh, is, is a New York based VC who's fantastic. So please listen to the episode because we get into it deep. But you know, the point here that she makes, and I think it's so good is you need to rethink every element of your business 
uh, that existed before COVID and figure out if it's relevant after COVID. It may mean that you've been working on a product for the last year and it no longer, you can't even launch it and, and it stinks, but that's reality. But at the same time, um, it may be that everybody rushes into things that aren't relevant in a year. So if you, if your thief hypothesis is that like we'll never leave our homes again, and then you run into this area or you shift to something like PPE, which is a short term opportunity, inshallah, we'll see. Um, you may find that at the end of a two or three years, you've made a bad choice there. So I think thinking about a business that will survive and thrive, no matter what happens is the best thing that you can do because at the end of the day, Entrepreneurs need to build businesses that are genuine to who they are, that are a combination of what they are good at and what they love to do. And if you're simply trying to make short-term game or arbitrage, um, yeah, you can make a buck here or there, but it's not a long-term business. Okay. And so I'll end it with one last question, uh, who wasn't asked now, but uh, was discussed earlier. And it was actually something on Reem's mind. Uh, and she was wondering, what is your view on fundraising in emerging markets? Will global investors start eyeing regions like ours more or less after this crisis pandemic? Yeah, I think your insights on this will be very valuable, Patrick, um, especially now with this pandemic and the valuations in, in emerging markets. Uh, how do you think investors, I mean, are they, will they be uh, looking for different markets outside the, the usual suspects or um, they will be more cautious, uh, more risk averse? Um, what's your take on that? That's a really hard question, mm -hmm. um, but I have some thoughts that I'll share. And part of this is informed by the fact that I'm actually uh, on the investment committee of a VC fund in Peru that invests across Latin America and we are in fundraising right now. So I am seeing how this is playing out real time. And I would say um, the traditional model, like, so I've been investing in emerging markets since 1999. And traditionally when um, developed markets crash, like it's like if developed markets get a cold, then emerging markets get like the flu, right? Because it's just like compounded. And that was always the way things used to be. I think that has changed um, to some degree because of just the, 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 the nature of financial markets. It's like, there's been a delinking uh, of things. Now with this particular crisis, it's really strange because of the way that some countries have been hit very hard and other countries have not been hit very hard. And we don't really know, part of it is because of preventative measures like what has been done in Jordan. But part of it is like, you know, I was reading an article yesterday, it's genetics, it's um, maybe you were, you were given tuberculosis medicine. And so we're gonna see this very strange thing where the impact of COVID will be uneven. And then also when sort of medications and vaccines are developed, inshallah, there's gonna be a fight over who gets what, and it's gonna create this really weird power dynamic. So what does that all mean? I think that what, what that means is that for the countries like Jordan that have not been affected as deeply, at least in terms of, I mean, listen, there's an economic effect and you know, no doubt, right? But um, that have been able to maintain, um, you know, sort of order and, and, and are gonna be able to go back more quickly. This is an opportunity to mobilize local capital um, because hopefully people will say, listen, right now, number one, um, this is actually a pretty good bet because we're coming out of this sort of relatively well. But number two, I would hope, and maybe I'm just, you know, way too optimistic about the nature of the world. I would hope that people in countries who do have means and can invest would say, you know what, we need to pull together right now. And it is incumbent upon us as a society to build something and to think about what capitalism should look like going forward and be better than we were in the past. Now, will that happen? Um, but I know that I'll tell you in the United States, so I'm very involved in political um, stuff here. Um, and I can tell you that the view in the US right now, at least among the people that I talk to, is that this crisis has exposed the fact that some of the flaws in our society that we could ignore easily in the past, we can no longer ignore. For example, that we have a very unfair healthcare system. Well, you know, it was fine when it was somebody you didn't know who got sick, but when it's the person who's bringing you your food or the person who works in the office next to you and you could get sick too, guess what? Your tolerance for a bad healthcare system is no longer what it was. And so I think that we're gonna start to see a rethink about, mm. about 
how we live, what capitalism means, what is just society. Um, and it's going to be painful and it's, it's, you know, but it is necessary. And so, and I'm not like a socialist, by the way, I'm a total capitalist, but, but I think that we, um, we have an opportunity to rethink. And so what I'm hoping anyway, is that people like ourselves in the business world can contribute to that conversation and say, listen, at the end of the day, people, you know, who fixes things, entrepreneurs, and we need entrepreneurs to come up with solutions to all these things and to come up with healthcare solutions that are relevant to the markets in which they operate. And so I'm hoping that that, that will be one of the positive things to come out of a time which is really, you know, pretty tough. Yeah. Inshallah, we really hope so too. And Patrick, really, Just, thank sorry, you. Sorry, Aya, but uh, on, on your uh, comment about... Uh, capitalism and redefining it we we uh, ran a campaign on our social media um, quoting our board members and high profile uh, mentors and actually one of our board members uh, Saddam Asher had an, an incredible quote on capitalism and the need for it to evolve and shift from actually focusing on becoming more of conscious uh, capitalism and focusing, trying to maximize uh, stakeholder value as opposed to shareholder uh, uh, value. And right, when you're talking about stakeholders, you include customers, employees, partners, regulatory bodies, shareholders, community, even the environment as a whole. So I think this, this, this thinking is uh, definitely taking place and, and uh, uh, people need to widen that um, that concept uh, to make it more conscious and more, um, more, uh, you know, uh, community, let's say communal, as opposed to just focused on the, on the me. Yeah. And on that point, um, I have on Thursday, my podcast, the one that's coming out on Thursday morning, um, I had a guy, uh, I'm sure if you guys, I don't know if you're familiar with the company, but in the Middle East, uh, in the US, it's Chobani, the yogurt company. Right. So she probably, so I interviewed the president and we talked and you know, Hamdi Lukaya, who's the founder, you know, that's their whole everything. And so we talk about this and it is, I mean, I just, I just don't see the downside of that personally. I mean, they're, they're private, so they have more bandwidth or flexibility, but I do think this is going to be a time where there will be people who will rethink what they're doing and it's going to benefit their business and also benefit their stakeholders, as you mentioned. So, Aya, you want to conclude? Yes, I mean, thank you so much, Patrick. This has been extremely, extremely, uh, you know, engaging and uh, interesting and always learning uh, new concepts. Um, amazing. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Patrick. And we're really, really appreciative of the fact that you're here with us when we literally have less than 24 hours before your book launch. Yes. So it really means a lot. Thank you for your time. And we really enjoy your talks and we look forward to maybe hosting you live again physically I, love, <laughs> I, I just wanted to launch my book first in jordan so you guys let me do that so yeah, love that. <laughs> you have to get it okay. translated also into arabic your second book absolutely right. let's do it yeah, yeah. Um, we're working on that stuff that's for sure <laughs> thank you patrick thank you everybody thank for you. Going thank you thank you bye bye